Hi everyone! I'm changing it up just a little bit this week and because I had so many vlogs last week I am just going to do a mid-month book review today instead of just overdoing it with the vlogs. So far in March I've read 11 books. Today is the 15th when I'm recording this I am too bad with dates to know what day this is coming out on. It's a Tuesday. It's after the 15th. I don't know what day it is. I think it's the 17th. We'll go with the 17th. But 11 books so far in March. That's pretty good for halfway through the month. I think we're probably going to slow down from here, but you never know. Everything else is closed and we're supposed to stay in our houses, so maybe I'll just do a whole lot more reading than I normally do. The first five books that I'm going to cover are from my 1920s reading, and I'm just going to tell you what they are. In the end of the month wrap-up, I always do my decades wrap-up, so I will get much, much more in-depth on these books at the end of the month. So first for 1921 was American Indian Stories by Zitkala Sa. Next up for 1922 was Diary of a Drug Fiend, which I read as an ebook from Aleister Crowley. Then Bambi for 1923 by Felix Salton. Next up for 1924 was a short story by H.P. Lovecraft called The Rats in the Walls. And finally, for 1925, I read The Great Gatsby by F. Scott Fitzgerald. The next category I am going to cover are the two books that I've read so far this month for my 2019 Goodreads challenge, where I read the winners and highest rated from the Goodreads Choice Awards from 2019. Both of the books that I read this month actually happen to be the winner and the highest rated in the nonfiction category, even though neither one of them were even vaguely the same premise. The first book that I read was Catch and Kill by Ronan Farrow, which was the highest rated in the nonfiction category. And this was the story of Ronan Farrow, who is an investigative reporter, kind of uncovering the story behind the Me Too movement and Harvey Weinstein sexually abusing a lot of actresses over many, many years as a very famous, well-known movie producer. And him finally getting caught. If you don't follow the news or anything like I don't, then he was just recently sentenced for sexually assaulting a bunch of women, and he's going to jail for a really long time. So that's good, but that's not how the story ended. This is literally just a nonfiction account of how this story landed in his lap and how he kept fighting to get it published and let the world know what a scumbag this guy was when all of these rich, powerful men in media, whether it's news, television, whatever, are basically doing the same thing and so they're trying to help Harvey hide his abuse so they can continue to um, sexually abuse women themselves. And it is a very hard to read story, but it's important that people speak for each other and when you're not a person of power to stand up and fight continuously these people in power who are abusing their power. Do I think everybody needs to go out and read this book? No. I am glad that this information like got out in the world and that Harvey Weinstein is going to jail for a long time but I don't actually think it's necessary to read about this particular story. Now, the winner of the nonfiction category is a story called Girls Stop Apologizing by Rachel Hollis, 
and she is what I would call a lifestyle blogger. She does YouTube, she does written blogs, she does public speaking, a bunch of different things like that. But basically this is a self-help book from her perspective. And she has no experience other than her own life to give help from. She is not a licensed psychologist and she seems to have a pretty cushy life. Like there there doesn't seem to be a whole lot of what is the word I'm looking for? Struggle as far as financially in her life. I guess she grew up poor, but then she ended up marrying a very rich man and ended up kind of being able to do whatever she wanted to because she had her husband to support her. And overall, I think the vast majority of the advice that she gives in this book is absolute trash and will probably send the poor person who follows her advice into financial ruin, horrible debt, and burn you out really quickly. And overall it's just like I worked really hard to get where I am, which I'm sure she did, but she was more able to fail than most of us are because she had a very wealthy husband who had a regular, I think he's a lawyer maybe, or some sort of business finance person, but he had enough money that he could easily support both of them while she failed. And she just happens she happened to get really lucky and she happened to have one of those personalities that really great at like selling stuff to other people and convincing other people that what she says is correct. And I just think all around that this was a really really horrible book. I, as I mentioned in my uh, vlog, I took like a lot of pages of notes on it, about six notebook pages full of notes where I kind of went over chapter by chapter exactly what I had a problem with. And then the, there was things that I agreed with. So I would mention those too. It's like, yeah, that's not bad advice. But eventually I'm going to sit down and go through all of that and kind of give my feedback on why that's bad advice. And it's not why this is bad advice coming from a medical professional. This is why this is bad advice coming from like a random person who can see without a degree like the problems with what she is saying. So I'm sure if like a psychiatrist or psychologist went and picked through all of the shit that she says they would find a whole lot more than I do. The next book that I read was for my monthly book club which was The Night Circus by Erin Morgenstern. I gave this five stars and I have decided that I love Erin Morgenstern's writing, but it's really not for everybody. This is a very whimsical story just like The Starless Sea was, which was one of, or which was my favorite book of last year, but what both of them do a lot of is like confusing timelines where as you're reading you're, you think that everything that you're reading is like on the same timeline, but they could be hundreds of years apart from each other and you don't realize it until much later. And it's a very whimsical story about two illusionists who perform actual real magic, but they have to hide it and make it seem like it's just an illusion and they're competing against each other in a circus that travels around the world magically and it's mostly the story of them being in this competition which they were raised to be in they had real no really no choice and then 
outside of that, it's like once their competition ends, what happens to everybody else involved in the circus? And it's just a really interesting story, but it's hard to follow. There's a lot of characters and it's very whimsical. And if that's not your type of like reading, then this book probably isn't for you, but it's exactly the type of book that I like, so I loved it. Next up are three of the four books that I read for the backlist readathon that happened from March 9th through the 15th, I believe. But I said three out of the four because one of them was The Great Gatsby, which I covered earlier. That was kind of a dual role book. First was Throne of Glass by Sarah J Maas, and this is the first Sarah J Maas book that I've ever read. You hear about her all of the time on booktube, and I was a little intimidated going into this because people either love her or absolutely hate her. And while I have to say that this is this is not a literary work, there are a lot of plot holes, a lot of problems with the writing, a lot of like things that don't really make sense, but it is an amazing story. It's an easy to follow and really fun and really amazing story. So if you kind of want to read something that doesn't require you to think about it a lot and you just want to be entertained, which is perfectly perfectly good reason to read a book. Don't shame people for reading books sheerly for the enjoyment of the story. This is a really good book. I was amused. I like the main character, Selena. She is a really interesting mix of a badass assassin, the best assassin in this entire world, and a teenage girl who wants to dress up and wear makeup and have boys tell her she's pretty. It's a weird combination, but I love it because it says that you can be a woman and be as girly as you fucking want to and still be a badass, and I respect it. So I liked it. I am looking forward to eventually, whenever I have time, finishing up the rest of this series and then potentially moving into A Court of Thorns and Roses, which is the other series by Sarah J Maas, which is a lot more pornographic from what I understand. Next up I read Vasa in the Night, which is a retelling of Vasilisa the Beautiful, which, for those of you who are not familiar with Russian folklore, is a Russian fairy tale that has to do with, like, a very pretty girl whose stepmother hates her, sends her off to be killed by Baba Yaga. This is a modern retelling that takes place in Brooklyn, and it's really bad because the author does not do a very good job of combining the modern telling or the modern setting with the fairy tale. It's just taken a fairy tale that only makes sense in like peasant Russia and then plopping it into Brooklyn. And it's like, why are these choices made? How does this magic system work? Like what the fuck is going on? It doesn't make sense. I think it's a mostly forgettable book and I don't really recommend it to anybody unless you're just obsessed with reading everything you possibly can about Russian folklore, but there's really books that are way, way better than this that have to do with Russian folklore if that's what you're looking for. The last book that I read for the Backlist Readathon was Frankly in Love, by David Yoon. This is a fake dating trope romance about a Korean American young man. And I'm gonna say like the first half to three-fourths of this book is just a very generic fake dating trope. 
and it wasn't interesting. But I do recommend if you want to read this book, if you're interested in Korean culture at all, to struggle through to the end and get past what you think is going to happen through the middle of the book because it looks like, I swear, it looks like every other fake dating book where the guy realizes that he's not really in love with the girl that he's trying to date, that he's actually in love with the person that he's fake dating, and everything ends happily ever after. But this one gets real at the end. You learn that high school isn't the end-all be-all. Your high school sweetheart is probably not the person you're going to end up with for the rest of your life. For some of y'all, maybe, but in all likelihood, probably not. Also, he deals with racist parents, but they grow together instead of just him ending with a Korean girl like his parents want him to they kind of grow and realize that this hatred for other cultures is actually really fucked up. And yeah, there's just like a lot of good things that are really realistic and not just fairy tale endings in this that I really, really like. So, and it deals with the subject of racism really really well. It deals with a lot of other subjects that I don't really want to tell you about because it, it, I'm afraid it's going to spoil the story, but it deals with a lot of really hard subjects really really well. Just the main point of the book that you can tell from the very beginning is that racism thing. So, very good book. I don't know that I highly recommend it, but if you like contemporary story, like contemporary romances, then you'd probably really like this. And that's the books that I've read so far this month. I'm going to give you a sneak peek on what's upcoming. I still have the five remaining books from my Century Read ready to go. I did a TBR on them. If you missed that and you're interested, I will stick it up in the cards. I also have another readathon later this month called The Royal Weekender for the Bookie Trials. That is March 28th and 29th. Originally, I had a tournament that weekend, but because of the coronavirus stuff, it's been canceled like every other gathering out there. So I will actually have that weekend to read what I want to. I will release a TBR for that weekend right before the weekend starts, so probably the 26th or 27th I will put a TBR. It is a two-day readathon, so I'm only going to try to read two books for it, especially since I already read a lot of books every month for other things. So we're going to keep it simple and have two books that cover all the prompts. I will go through the prompts and everything like that during that TBR. And I expect that to be up on probably Thursday the 26th, but it might not go up till Friday the 27th, but it will definitely be up before that readathon. And then I will vlog the readathon and then put that up the following Tuesday. So thank you for coming in today and I will see you Saturday. <laughs>